Uh, I'm Eric, and I'm going to be talking about machine learning with public collider data. And this is based on work with my awesome collaborators, Patrick, Rada, Preksha, and Jesse. So just a few kilometers away, there's the large uh, Hadron Collider. And uh, what's going on there? Well, sort of at a, at a high level, take two protons. You send them on a collision course, smashing them together at really high energies. You hopefully produce some interesting particles. For example, here, uh, some energetic quarks, which then radiate some gluons. And then you try and detect as much as you can about what, uh, what comes out of that collision. So in this case, this is an event recorded by the CMS detector at the LHC. And what we have here from those two quarks is what's known as a dijet event with two energetic sprays of particles called jets. And I'll come back to those later. Uh, this talk is also about a collision course, much like this entire session between AI and physics. This talk is about uh, public collider data uh, released by the CMS experiment starting in 2014, meeting, of all things, optimal transport, which is a field of mathematics that's very relevant to machine learning, with a nice workshop on it uh, at NeurIPS last month. And what's going to come out of this collision? Well, two things. First, we're going to unlock the ability to do all sorts of interesting, unsupervised uh, learning techniques applied to collider data in ways that we weren't able to do before. And actually, an interesting other dividend that you'll get are some new insights back into sort of the heart of physics, quantum field theory and collider physics. So some new insights into particle physics. So I'll jump right in. Like I mentioned, starting in 2014, the CMS experiment has been releasing research-grade public collider data, which is awesome for people like uh, me and some of you who aren't members of an experimental collaboration, and it lets you get your hands dirty doing proof-of-principle studies and exploratory analyses. And if you want to take a look at that, it's all available on the open data portal uh, at CERN at this link here. So getting started with the open data might seem a little bit daunting. There are terabytes of data. You have to install some virtual machine or environment. You have to work within the CMS software system. But actually, if you just want to get your hands dirty really quickly, you can do it in a matter of a few minutes. And I'll sort of show you how to do that. You find your favorite file. Uh, of data, so uh, I want to talk about jets, those sprays of particles. So I'm going to look up, uh, look at the uh, jet primary data set. Uh, one file there is about a gigabyte. Instead of going through their uh, software system, you can actually use the uproot Python package to go directly from the what's known as a root file that the data is stored in into a NumPy array, circumventing a lot of the uh, software overhead that would typically be required to start working with this data. And so in 15 lines of code, you can go from downloading a file to looking at real collisions recorded by the CMS detector. So here, just to uh, summarize what we're seeing, you have your detector, you can think of as a cylinder wrapped around the collision point. And here, uh, this collision, I've sort of sliced open that cylinder and laid it flat. Every point here is a particle, or a candidate for a particle that's been detected. And the more energetic the particle is, the larger its circle. So in a few minutes, you can actually start uh, digging into some collider data and thinking about using it for some interesting machine learning studies. And I'll talk more about these uh, a little bit later on. But again, these are these jets that I'm going to uh, spend a little bit more time unpacking later in this talk, these sprays of particles. So we have our data set. Uh, interesting collider data, real collider data released by CMS, and now we want to do some machine learning with it. Uh, sort of there, one, one thing you might want to do is supervise learning, training classifiers, and doing all sorts of interesting things on that front. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about the interesting work we have going on there. What I want to focus on in uh, this talk is unsupervised learning. So things like uh, k-means, k-nearest neighbors, classifiers, uh, in, intrinsic dimensionality estimation, T-SNE visualization, a whole host of techniques require one thing of your data set, and that's a distance matrix. They give them a distance matrix and they return to you all sorts of interesting insights about your data. So that tells me that we need a physically sensible metric between different collision events. And that's something that we haven't thought about in a fully general way uh, in collider physics up until this point. To drive this point home, here are two different collider events recorded by CMS. They look pretty similar. They both have these two jets in more or less the same spot. They have more or less the same energy. But how can you quantify how similar these two things are? You might want to try and come up with, uh, with a few summary statistics and compare those. Uh, 
but then you'll end up saying that certain things look the same, uh, are the same, even though they might look totally different. You might try and pixelize this into, a, into an image and take some sort of pixel-wise norm, but then if I shift the entire event by one pixel, I'll suddenly think it's totally different, whereas I should be able to wiggle around these particles without changing how, uh, how distant these two events are. So it's an interesting physics question that's forced on you by just trying to apply certain machine learning techniques to collider data. And I'll tell you the answer that we came up with to this question, or rather, uh, I'll show you. So we're gonna treat the event, this collision event, as a distribution of energy on the cylinder. And then we have the question, how do I compare two distributions? Well, that's something that's of a lot of interest to people in the machine learning community. And one very popular answer is this Wasserstein, or Earth Mover's Distance. So uh, taking us back to physics, it's the work that's required sort of energy times distance on this cylinder to rearrange the red event into the blue event. And the less work I have to do to perform that rearrangement, the closer these two events are. And the more work I have to do, the farther these two events are. So that gives me my metric that unlocks for me all these interesting unsupervised learning techniques that I might want to apply. But actually, just being forced to ask this physics question based on applying machine learning techniques, actually teaches you something fundamentally new. And to show you how this is a sort of a very rich insight, I want to do a lightning overview of six decades of collider physics and some of the greatest hits uh, in collider physics since the 1960s. So first, uh, back in the early 60s, some folks figured out how to stop getting infinity all the time and only get infinity some of the time and that was uh, with this notion of infrared and collinear safety. This was then applied to a bunch of summary, to develop many interesting summary statistics about events, interesting observables. Then how to define these sprays of particles in a way that makes sense experimentally and theoretically using clustering algorithms like uh, sequential hierarchical clustering. Moving into the LHC era, we start looking inside of these jets and do things which are similar to k-means clustering within these jets, looking at their substructure and how they're formed. And then also in the LHC era, we have a new and interesting challenges in a high pileup environment. And so there's a whole host of interesting algorithms and techniques and ideas that have been developed in over 50 years. And actually, this, these six techniques of collider, uh, these six decades of collider techniques can actually all be translated very naturally into this language of optimal transport. So this notion of taming infinities, well, when you have a metric, you have the metric topology and the notion of continuity. And so this lets you define some notion of continuity in your space of events, which corresponds to exactly the types of uh, objects that we can compute for in perturbative quantum field theory. Some of those uh, event statistics that people define, like thrust and sphericity, actually turn out to be geometric objects in an abstract space of events. In this case, the, the quantity known as thrust is the distance between your event and a manifold of two particle events. This notion of jets, how do you define them? How do you determine which, how, which algorithms to use? Actually ends up being the question of how can I best approximate my event, which might have thousands of particles, with let's say n equals two or three particles. And many pileup mitigation techniques can actually be translated directly into questions of uh, semi-discrete, unbalanced optimal transport. And actually, all of, the, all of these algorithms and all of these techniques developed over decades can be derived very simply from some sort of starting principles using this distance between events as a sort of guiding principle. So just being forced to ask that question gave us a new insight into sort of the history of collider physics and is also allowing us to develop some new techniques stretching out here into the future, which I won't have time to talk about now. So let's go back and use this metric to actually do some interesting unsupervised learning, learn something about the data set, how it looks and its dimensionality. So here's that event from before, here are the two jets. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna carve the jets out of, out of all of the events and I'm gonna make a data set of jets. And one thing I might wanna do is sort of think, okay, how wide are these jets? What is sort of this, the, the variance or how um, spread out is the radiation within them? And something that's very commonly used is the jet mass to accomplish this. And so you can make a histogram of sort of how wide the jet is and how often you encounter a jet of that width. But unless you're a 
unless you're familiar with the physics that drives jet formation, this is pretty uninformative. But one thing you can do is you can find the most representative jets in each one of these histogram bins. And by that I mean finding the, the K, let's say the four metoid jets, the four jets whose distance to everything, uh, whose distance to the data set is minimized. And then you can just plot them above each histogram bin. And here you can immediately see much more about what it is that drives jet formation with low mass jets having one prong and higher mass jets having two prongs. And we can actually exactly understand this based on the process of jet formation in QCD. Jets acquire mass, let's say that quark emits a gluon which widens out the jet. Anomaly detection uh, is something which is really interesting uh, presently for uh, LHC studies in a more model independent way. And once you have a metric, you can start asking broader questions like, how typical is this red jet? Well, it has a, most of its neighbors are nearby, so it's a pretty typical jet compared to this blue jet, which is farther away from the data set. So you can start sorting events based on how typical or anomalous they are, with more typical jets being one or two pronged, as we saw in the previous slide, and the most anomalous or distant jets being three pronged or hazy or stranger topologies based on rare processes in QCD. Another interesting, another interesting thing that you can do once you have a metric is actually try to visualize what this space looks like. And one very popular uh, technique to do that is TSNI embedding, which tries to populate the data set onto this slide in a way that tries to preserve the distance. And all you really need to hand it is a distance matrix. So what does the space of jets look like? Well, here in gray, I've shown the contours of the learned embedding of jets. Sort of there's a, one, uh, a peak here and a large tail. And then throughout it, I've shown the 25 most representative jets scaled by how much of the data you can explain, uh, how much of the data they explain. So just a general lesson here is that there are a lot of one-pronged jets with two-pronged jets uh, going out this way. And actually, you can understand both dimensions of this learned embedding of the space of jets. Again, from this uh, picture of a quark emitting a gluon, the gluon has some energy E and is emitted at some angle theta. And if you go uh, this way, you see the submission getting wider and wider angle. These two prongs are at a wider and wider angle. Whereas as you go up, the emission goes from being sort of a very soft, very low energy emission to being very hard and almost balanced with the quark. So just as a sort of concluding theme, I wanna discuss the interesting example of measuring the dimensionality of your data set. And one thing which is very interesting to do that is a notion of correlation dimension or a fractal dimension. And the idea here is if you have some toy data set here, uh, the number of neighbors that you expect a point to have should, as, uh, in a ball of radius R around it should scale as R to the dimension. And you can invert that intuition to actually get a concrete definition that takes the form here, which has been known since the 80s and is also of interest, uh, has been of interest to the ML community. And uh, so this is a scale dependent notion of dimension. So looking at this data set at large dimension, at large scales, it looks one dimensional, looks like a line. And at uh, sort of smaller and smaller dimensions as you zoom in, it becomes two dimensional. So you can think of this as uh, approximately probing how many degrees of freedom you need to explain your data set up to accuracy Q. And all this requires again is a distance matrix, which we've developed. So we can ask, what does that look like for our data set of jets? And that's shown here. So the dimensionality of our data set is shown in black with some cross checks from simulation in uh, blue and in orange. And what we see here is similar to this behavior as at large uh, energy scales. So this notion, of di uh, this notion of distance has dimensions of energy. So at large distances, your data set is pretty low dimensional. You don't need that many degrees of freedom to explain it. Whereas as you go in and look at smaller and smaller, uh, smaller and smaller distances, which correspond to lower and lower energy scales, the uh, dimensionality of your data set goes up and up and up. And this is actually related to the fractal nature of QCD, the fact that this actually doesn't level off at a particular number, but it, the data sort of gets more and more complex the lower, the softer and softer uh, the uh, information that you resolve. So. Uh, this is a really interesting insight into uh, jet formation, into the, strong, the theory of the strong force, quantum chromodynamics. Uh, 
And actually, you can go even further than this and try and calculate this uh, interesting object, this correlation dimension of your data set, calculated from first principles in quantum field theory. And so for jets initiated by quarks, we can actually compute this correlation dimension and separately for jets initiated by gluons. And what we see here is we exactly capture this interesting behavior that as you go to lower and lower energies, the uh, correlation dimension of your data set increases and increases without bound. And the data is some admixture of quark and gluon jets, so it ends up right in between uh, these two curves. So that's a broad summary of what I want to talk about, this interesting collision of public collider data and the questions that it makes you ask, applying lots of uh, ideas from the sort of AI and physics community, forces you to ask new and interesting questions, making some friends along the way, in this case, optimal transport. And this lets you do a whole bunch of new and interesting things to your data, and also predict a lot of those new and interesting things, as well as teach you something new about quantum field theory that you didn't know before. And I'll just conclude by mentioning that this data set of jets that we've processed uh, is that we've publicly released, so if you're interested, I encourage you to check that out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, uh, very interesting to see these connections um, between optimal transport and, and jet physics. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Great talk. Thanks a lot. Um, about the definition of EMD, usually yes. if we compare two jets, we don't want to uh, tell them, say they're far away if the, if the energy is different. So do you renormalize them to the yes. same energy? So I think yeah. Let's slide to look at here. So you, okay, so you divide, you, you normalize to a... Yeah, so uh, uh, here. So we, you could do one of two things. One, you could normalize them to have the same energy, or you could put a penalty to, uh, for the creation okay. and destruction of energy, which still maintains this metric property. So you could sort of do one of two things. Okay, and then another uh, related question, is this EMD uniquely defined, or you still have some tuning parameters? So uh, the tuning parameters are essentially just what you treat as the distance on the cylinder. So do you take you know, this, the, the sort of Euclidean distance here? Do you take square root of that? There's sort of many metrics you can put on the, on the cylinder. So you have some choices there. But sort of using the making it a distribution of energy in some space that's more or less uniquely fixed by some symmetries of perturbative QCD. Thanks. More questions? So I guess I have uh, uh, well, a couple questions, but um, one, uh, it, when you were speaking to look at this kind of these questions of dimensionality, um, is there a way to define observables that might be maximally or minimally strong to, for instance, the value of alpha strong? So you're, you're kind of coming up with a new class of observables, right. um, which, I mean, these scaling dimension must be very strongly correlated with the value of alpha strong. So like yeah, future measurements. Here, for example. Yeah. The strong coupling constant just drives that entirely. So do you think this could lead to interesting new ways to, for instance, do precision alpha strong measurements? Yeah, I mean, so e e sort of even the taking a bigger picture, this in the traditional sense that we talk about is not an observable. Observables you would think of as I, I see an event, I compute, I like uh, compute something about it and then I fill a histogram or you know, a single number. Whereas this is defined in terms of pairs of events. So it's just like an interesting new structure to think about. So that sort of on its own often drives you to think about new and interesting calculational techniques on the theory side, sort of thinking about how, how to even go about computing something like this. So it, just in terms of broadening your thinking of the types of objects you can compute about a data set, now that you're thinking about like interesting correlations and the sort of geometry of your data set, I think the answer is yes. And sort of more pedestrianly, yes, I think things like this for example, right here, this, this measuring the slope tells you the strong coupling constant. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of potential to come up with new and interesting objects to let you probe some standard model parameters better. Thanks. Uh, if there are no more questions, then let's thank Eric again.